In this episode we're going to cover this year's election, 2017 for parliament in the Netherlands. And we're going to discuss the one that has a lot of people worried, a man by the name of Geert Wilders, or as many know him, Geert Wilders. The Netherlands is a constitutional monarchy and its civilians have the right to vote. Now the constitution is very much a dead letter because no judge has ever ruled on it. There is no constitutional court. The head of state is a monarch, a king, a member of a rich banker's family with unknown investments in banks and multinationals. Every new piece of legislation is first passed by the king, then it's moved off to first parliament and then the senate where further debate takes place and its members have for the most part taken an oath of allegiance to the king. And if at the end a new piece of legislation is still met with objection then civilians can still go to the Council of State with its own independent president, the king. It's good to be the king. Four years back, Rutte won was a minority cabinet consisting of the conservative VVD, Rutte's own party, and the Christian Democratic CDA. This cabinet was supported by Geert Wilders' party, the PVV, until spring of 2012, when Brussels forced the Dutch to make budget cuts. Three parties came to the rescue, the Christian Union, the left liberal D66 and the Green Left Party. The Social Democrats did not agree with the budget cuts until after the elections. They were clearly given a chance to win some seats in parliament and it worked. Many voters manifested their fears. One large group was very afraid the conservatives would win, so they voted Social Democrat. The other group was very afraid the Social Democrats would win, so they voted Conservatives. And it worked. Uh, on the evening of the elections, it was commented that the clear desire of the Dutch voter was for a cabinet with both the Conservatives and the Social Democrats, which was of course the last thing anyone wanted. The Dutch voter was predictable and Rutte had his second term. Election results are the best proof of mass amnesia. So let's look back at four years of Rutte II, a cabinet that was typified by scandals, lies and broken promises. Not in the least from Rutte himself, he, who puts it like this, that he couldn't completely keep his promise. Other than that, there was the Justice Department that saw a change out of ministers twice over scandals. Malaysian Airlines MH17 was shot out of the skies in Ukraine. The Dutch government responded with tears and emotions, but not so much fact-finding. In fact, Rutte signed a non-disclosure agreement with one of the suspects, the Ukrainian chocolate puppet regime. We may never know who shot down MH17, but in the meantime, let's blame the Russians one of our most important trading partners. Then there was Jeroen Dijsselbloem, who headed a delegation of ministers of finance to Cyprus to deal with yet another banking crisis. He was very pleased with himself when he invented the bail-in. This time it wasn't taxpayers money to deal with a banking crisis, now it's people's savings that are going to be used for such crises, because in the future the EU is going to use that model for other banking crises. So how does that cashless society sound for you now? Then there was CETA, casually signed off on by 
Foreign Trade Minister Lilian Ploume. CETA is of course the plan B to TTIP. Then we saw the referendum on the association treaty with the EU and Ukraine. The Dutch people voted on it, rejected that treaty and about a year later saw that the parliament in the majority rejected the result of that referendum. The Dutch are getting used to seeing their referenda results ignored. Again, Jeroen Dijsselbloem also forked over a couple of hundreds of millions of euros to Brussels on their demand. Why he did that, he is not going to tell us. He refuses that. Then we saw the, yet another illegal war after Libya in Syria, where Rutte too decided to send F-16s to do some bombing in the east side of that sovereign country, creating yet more refugees with in between uh, obvious terrorists because they are being identified on asylum seeking centers. It's quite a poor result for a government. On to Geert Wilders, who is expected to win largely with his PVV during the elections of this year. He's not going to get a majority in parliament, uh, so he still will have to find other parties to work with. Um, but uh, he does get a lot of media exposure. There's a migration crisis, there are the developments outside the country with Brexit, with Trump, with Marie Le Pen. There is um, also a total lack of effective criticism and that little trouble he had with the security also enhances his role as an underdog. If you ask me, Geert Wilders is controlled opposition. He's the devil puppet that makes puppetry interesting and brings excitement to the children. He's not really a maverick. Before he was an average Conservative Party member, member of the VVD, he has a, a mixed racial background, he's partly Indonesian, and he didn't really voice much criticism towards Islam before, until now, because only after Pim Fortuyn was assassinated did he develop into the Geert Wilders that we come to know. Pim Fortuyn was a true nuisance, an embarrassment to the establishment, openly gay, homosexual, um, he uh, had a clear vision of for the country so he was taken out he was shot on the media park here in Hilversum and so Patsy was given the blame but there's more Geert Wilders um, there's a, a declaration that surfaced a few years back on a dinner with conservative party members in the 90s. A couple set up this declaration initially to send to the uh, to the intelligence service, the secret service in the Netherlands, who did nothing with it. What was the case? After a couple of glasses of wine, Geert Wilders started singing Israeli songs, claimed that he was recruited by Israeli intelligence trained by Israeli intelligence, who also gave him a passport, who also helped him get divorced from his previous wife and get married to his current Hungarian wife. And then he realized that that wasn't the smartest thing to do, so he voiced a few threats to all the guests not to say anything to anyone. Uh, you don't know really 
um, if this is true. But what you can see is that he is very much uh, friendly towards Israel. He even shows the colors white and blue very often, very ostentatiously. And you have to wonder his wife, who is living in army barracks under the same security as Geert Wilders himself, who's doing that for years. Why would she put up with that? It takes a very special woman to accept that. It's very likely that she also has a double passport and she may have a double role as well, perhaps as a handler to Geert Wilders. If we had true journalism, someone would do some investigation. Geert Wilders, he voices his opinions in short liners very effectively, usually um, unrealistic promises towards his voters. They are never debated. Geert Wilders doesn't debate outside of parliament, even during the election. He's always the absent one. It doesn't seem to matter. He will still get the votes. His voters are usually depicted as racist, irrational, uneducated simpletons, especially by the left. Many left, left voters never ever have spoken with a PVV voter, so they don't know what they are thinking. Uh, but it's very easy to define your own devil. And it would be painful for the left because there would be shown an image of the results of what happens after so many years and years and years of left-leaning policy with regards to immigration especially. And if you are not left-leaning, then what choice do you have? If you're not a globalist, not pro-EU, there's not much to choose from. Still, Wilders is compared with Trump, unfairly, if you ask me, because for Geert Wilders you do find a track record. You can find what he voted in Parliament. And for his voters, it would be very disappointing to find out what Geert Wilders really stands for. Imagine this. Every four years you receive a voucher that you can bring to a shop and the shop promises you a box with a wonderful contents. But you know that when you bring it back home, you open it up, it is full of disappointment if there is anything in it at all. How often will you repeat the process until you realize that you're being fooled? And how often do you want to be humiliated this way? This is the way I look at the election. And if you participate in the election, you should not complain about what you get afterwards. The Dutch have a lot of choice when it concerns political parties. Two is ridiculous, but 28? Here you see the situation after the 2012 elections. In blue and red you see the governing parties, in purple the PVV of Geert Wilders. Let's see what the polls say. Geert Wilders' party is expected to double in size, ending with some 30 seats. Prime Minister Mark Rutte will finally have to pay for the scandals and drop to 28 seats. Many will have forgotten what the Christian Democrats did in the past, which helps them to 18 seats. The liberal left D66 might see a modest rise to 14 seats. Dutch Labour, the Social Democrats, will take a serious beating for what they did. They also lost power when parliament members left and held on to their seat. They dropped to 12. 
The Green Left Party with newcomer Jesse Klaver might grow from 4 to 18 seats. Amnesia is a big driving force. The Socialist Party did not show itself very much and is expected to lose a few seats. If this doesn't tickle your fancy, you can find plenty of other choices. For instance, the people that organized the referendum are now in three separate parties. And as politics is show business for ugly people, I won't mind seeing more of these girls. Mm. This is it. Now you have a fair idea of what to expect of the Dutch elections. If you like this clip, then please hit the like button and you can even become a member of my channel. Thanks for watching. Until later.